No one has ever given me anything. Everything has been what the players have put out there. But just like Dusty has always told me and Eric Davis and Barry and Gary Sheffield, all those guys have said, look man, stay the course. Your time will come. So I feel like 2021 has kind of started this catapult into something big. My name is James, also known as Mims Band. I'm here with Tops, and this is Project 70, Meet the Artists. My dad introduced me to baseball, I would say like four or five years old. Would take me to baseball games, just he and I. Sit on his lap, watch games. Dodgers were obviously his favorite team, so I kind of gravitated towards that. But as far as back as I can remember, baseball has always been a part of my DNA. It's something that I love and I can appreciate as I've gotten older. My parents told me I used to talk a lot. So I was easy to get along with, easy to talk to people. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. That's where my true desires were. That's where my heart was, and that's where I put in my work. Jim Gillian, who's the first base coach with the Dodgers, was my godfather. He was roommates with Jackie Robinson. I first met Dusty in 1975, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I'm sitting in the dugout, and he came up and he introduced himself to me. I'll never forget, he said, hi, I'm Dusty, and I told him who I was, and it, I was just like, shocked that that was the way he introduced himself, but that's just truly who he is, and he's been that way since 1975, just a real steady dude. So fast forwarding, 1986, I'm studying, and I said, oh, man, I don't wanna go into corporate America. If there's something that I could do to stay attached to baseball, I'd love to do it. So I wore wristbands throughout junior high, high school, college. And I called him and I said, hey man, I think I, I have an idea that I want to pass by you. And I drove out to his house and I had a hand-stitched version. And he looked at it and started laughing like, I said, give it time, give it time. You have to like think outside of the box. A week later, I found someone who could actually put it on a computer. I was able to get a little better detail, so I drove out there again. And that's when he said, aha, I think we have something. And he said, what do you plan on doing with it? I said, I plan on outfitting every player that will give me an opportunity. So I drove down to spring training. I gave him the finished product, and that's really where it started. Carney Lansford, Michael Davis, Tony Phillips were the guys that immediately gravitated towards it, and it was just a snowball effect from there. Was there things in fashion and culture and art that kind of inspired your approach to making these? It was more about the players being able to represent themselves. Even back then, I was always a forward thinker. And I looked at everything that the players were endorsing, it was about the company. It was never about the player. And one of the things that I did know, because Dusty educated me on that, was that there were no rules barring the players from wearing themselves. And when he told me that, I knew then that this would be a winner. Even to today, when you think about a lot of the products that are out there, now they're representing the players. Can you imagine 1985, 1986? I was out there by myself and everyone just said, oh, they laughed at it. Conceptually, there's like laugh. But when they started seeing the players who were wearing it, then all of a sudden they took notice. And then the Saranax and all those companies had to step their game up, but they could never ever touch the product because this is the player. Dominic Smith, Arenado, Josh Harrison. It's a change in the guard. This generation, there's a lag. There's not a, a bridge for me to cross yet, but I will, because guys on the Astros have inquired. Throughout the league, guys have inquired. So it's just a matter of time before it gets back to where it needs to be. But the guys that are wearing it are steady. I first have to meet the individuals. I just don't take on everyone. It's really about, do you understand what the product is and what it represents, and do you know who came before you? and that's important to me so they'll have a better understanding that not everyone can have it. Because there are guys in the big leagues way back then, they were great players. Personality-wise, I just didn't get that feel. I don't want it to be the norm. I don't want everyone to have it because it waters down the product. I want everybody to be able to look at the 130 plus guys who have worn it and see who they were as baseball players. I know them as men, but it's an educational tool as well. That's why I stick with it because I think it's a teaching tool that will allow children to go to their phones or computers and Google these players who wore this product and clearly, clearly understand 
that even if you don't make it to the big leagues, you still have an opportunity to be around a sport that you love. It will continue to live on just through that alone. Let's talk tops. Big part of your life now. I'm mm -hmm. curious what was tops in your life earlier? Oh, everything. Uh, I still have cards to this day. I've always collected cards. My prized possession, prize for me, is a Dusty Baker rookie card and a Jim Gilliam rookie card. But I've always collected baseball cards. I never put them in my bicycle making all the crazy noise. Nope. I knew at some point there was, something was going to happen with them. I've got them stored away. Always been a part. Always. From the large 6x9 Hank Aaron mantle cards down to just your regular size cards. Always a part of it. I don't really call myself just your average fan. I'm not. I go way beyond average because of my access to baseball that I've always had. I mean, I've got bats from Eric Davis, Gary Sheffield, Joe Carter, Jesse Barfield. I got Dusty's glove that he won the Gold Glove Award with. I used it in high school throughout college. There's so much. You, you would be here all day for me to list every single thing. But if I had to pick out one item, it was shoes that my godfather gave me about six months before he passed that I used in high school. A year ago, getting the call from Tops for the opportunity, what was that like for you? Mind blowing. I mean, a quick little story is that when I first started the bands, I called Tops. I wanted to be a part of Tops. Somehow I send in packages where they can get a band, and then I got a Dear John letter. So to think 30 plus years later, here I am designing cars for Tops, it's like, it's surreal to me. Every one of my cars has a story attached to it. Either I know the player personally, or I know someone that is attached to them and has given me stories about those players, which is why and how I choose the guys that I use. So when I chose Eric Davis, I wanted people to go Google and see who this guy was. Barry Bonds was chasing Eric Davis. So that's one of the reasons why I chose him. But a lot of the other cars that I've done, Mickey Mantle, Al Downing is a very good friend of mine. They were teammates with the Yankees. And the stories that he used to tell me about Mickey Mantle, it was someone who I wanted to meet. So I was like, well, let me pay homage. Hank Aaron, that goes without saying, that was Dusty's man. And I had the pleasure of meeting him with a surprise visit from Dusty. So that's why I chose Mr. Aaron because of who he was as a person. Visually, it depends on the player. So when I look at, I'll just use Eric Davis as an example. He was born in 1962, so I attach immediately. I go and I'll look at a 1962 card. And then I would really try to put in that card how I remember him as a player. And one of the things that Eric Davis was known for was he was a 5-2 player. But the swing and the pose that I chose in that particular card, it's like, it's dead on perfect. I mean, if you had to draw angles on it, it's perfect from the legs to the arms to the extension, everything. And he remembers that picture because he remembered hitting a home run on that particular swing. That's how vivid it was for him. So when he told me that, I had to capture that moment. It's interesting because when I looked at the roster, I think I'm like the only one attached to baseball. Everyone has a story about baseball and when they started. So I feel like amongst all of them, I would love to sit down and have conversations with them just to get an idea of how they see it, what was their attachment to baseball. I've seen a lot of the interviews and a lot of them have attachments, but when you're in a group with some of the guys that I'm in the group with, it's jaw-dropping. When I Googled them to find out exactly who they were, it was like, whoa, I, you know, I didn't know this and I didn't know that. I didn't know who DJ Ski was. I had no clue, like none. The only person I knew on there was like Snoop, I think. Yeah, he was the only one. But to see, again, my name on that list, honored and humbled for sure. I could drive a stick, but I'm driving someone else's Porsche. You know, it's still, he's like my dad, but still it's like, I, I was scared, right? So it's something different. It's over here as opposed to here. So the first gear I wrenched him. And man, I floored it. And he was like, I didn't mean drive it like that. I mean, I was flying across the bridge.
I am Brittany Palmer. It's King Saladin. This is Gregory Siff. And I'm here with my homies from Tops. And this is Project 70. Project 70. Project 70. Meet the artist. Meet the artist. I don't need a wave. Stay in school. <laughs>